welcome to Discourse About Nothing, the only Seinfeld-themed true crime podcast on the internet. Today, as always, we'll be taking an in-depth look at Newman, the serial killer behind the vicious Seinfeld murders of the mid-90s. I would like to remind everybody that this is not safe for young children. This podcast examines domestic violence, Newman vs. Jerry, George vs. Elaine, Kramer vs. The Door, everyone's involved. This is not a full episode today. It's just me again. Matt is busy. He's preparing for his big day. Finally, you know, tying the knot. Probably a bowline hitch. (laughs) Um, This isn't a full episode. It's a mini episode. It's just me. And it's really just a short, very short response. Maybe like a corrective to another podcast that I really admire. And that has a lot more listeners than us, obviously. That podcast is Very Bad Wizards. It is hosted by Dave Pizarro and Tamler Summers. Tamler is a philosopher. He works mostly in metaethics and the overlap between uh, philosophy, well, moral philosophy and moral psychology. And then Dave Pizarro is a psychologist who also does a lot of philosophy. And they both they both work in that same area, moral psychology is one of their big interests um and their podcast has i mean a lot of different topics but the stuff that i like most about it is where meta ethics and uh moral psychology meet they just did their last episode episode 160 on ecclesiastes where after you get through the introduction they just talk about their thoughts on the book of ecclesiastes for anybody who's read ecclesiastes you know that it has uh, intense existentialist themes. Uh, it's primarily about the meaning of life or from in one reading, the vanity or the total vanity of life and everything we do on earth. I really recommend everybody go listen to their podcast on it. Like I said, I'm not doing a full podcast. I'm doing a really short response. Uh, and I'm hoping that this short response will offer people who listen to their episode a sort of balance between what they're saying and their readings and mine. Their overall impression is that the writer constantly seems to contradict himself and it's, I don't care, I'm not trying to defend contradictions, that's not the point. It's that the writer keeps setting forward this nihilistic or uh, view where everything is vanity No matter what you do, it's all vain because it ends in death and is finite and no one will remember you. And then maybe says something that contradicts that. Like, oh, there is a difference between right and wrong. There is a difference between being virtuous and uh, wicked. And they were really wrestling with how do you solve or eliminate those contradictions? Like, what's he trying to get at? And overall, I think their picture in the end it seemed like from their podcast that they both thought that the author of Ecclesiastes endorsed this view that's like, yeah, eat, drink, and be merry with the time you've got because we all die anyway. And who knows if that's the end or if there's an afterlife or whatever. Who knows? And I don't really think that's how we should read it. And I'm only going to really deal with the first three chapters of Ecclesiastes, because I think if you read it carefully, there's some hints about what he's up to, what the author's up to. So don't listen to this until you've either read through the book of Ecclesiastes or at the very least listened to their podcast, got their views, because this is only a response to them. So the first thing I'm going to point out is that in verses 1, 13, and 14, author or authors of Ecclesiastes point out that God has provided man with a series of painful distractions or work that's distraction, uh, distracting, and that this is chosen by man to engage in. I gave my heart to seek out and to prepare myself in wisdom concerning all the things done under heaven, for God has given painful distraction to the sons of men to be occupied therewith. I beheld all the works done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and is the choice of one spirit. Then again, let's jump to 117. I gave my heart to know wisdom and knowledge, to learn proverbs and understanding, and this too was a waywardness of spirit. 
So how I'm reading this is that the author is saying that God provided the opportunity for people to engage in work that's vanity, that's meaningless. And a lot of the things that we would consider meaningful or non-vain uh, are actually vain. That we can seek uh, to know wisdom and gain knowledge, to learn Proverbs and understand, but that ultimately when we seek these things, it's a problem with our choices, a problem with what we're desiring, a waywardness of spirit, as verse 17 says. The author says that he knows this from experience. He says that the things he has done and sought to do and what to work on are instances of choosing vain work, or ch in my translation, choosing distractions. You skip ahead to 2.17 and he says, Thus I have hated life because the work done under the sun was evil before me, for all is vanity and is the choice of one's spirit. I think what that says to me is um, he hates life. The author hates life because his work has been vain, because he chose to engage in the distractions that God has provided and not something contrasting that, which he hasn't led on what sort of non-vain work might contrast that. And it seems like an open question whether there is non-vain work. Maybe the author thinks there is no non-vain work, all is vanity. Or maybe he thinks that there is really non-vain, meaningful work that he could have been engaging in, but instead was distracted from. And I think that uh, their reading, Very Bad Wizards reading, was that all is vanity, there is no non-vain work to engage in, so make the most of it. Sort of like Camus' Myth of Sisyphus. My reading is that no, there is a difference between vain and non-vain work, and there is a, a at least some set of non-vain and meaningful, valuable, good projects you can engage in. And this goes back to the Susan Wolf podcast too, right? We can understand what the author of Ecclesiastes is saying maybe as which projects do I engage in, which are non-vain, which are vain, which are valuable, which are not valuable. So are there, in the view of the author of Ecclesiastes, any non-vain or meaningful or valuable projects or goals or work to engage in? Is there any non-distracting, non-vain work? And I think there is, because he specifically contrasts the work that the wicked uh, do with the work that the righteous do. Look at verse 224 uh, to 226. There's nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink, and that his soul should enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw was from the hand of God, for who will eat or who will drink without him? And he gives wisdom, knowledge, and gladness to a man who is good in his sight. But to him who commits sin, he gives the job of gathering and collecting, that he may give to the man who is good in God's sight. This is also vanity and is the choice of one's spirit. 224 to 226, I'm reading it as saying that God gives the wicked vain work to do and that will ultimately benefit the righteous or those people who do the good thing, who eat and drink and enjoy in their souls the good things of or in your labor. 312, I know there's nothing better for them than to rejoice and do good in their lives. Indeed, every man should eat and drink and experience the good in all his labor. This is God's gift to him. I think the key thing here, if my translation's accurate, and I can go check the Greek, but I don't know Hebrew. I can slowly translate the Greek. I know there's nothing better for them than to rejoice and do good in their lives. The wicked man, it seems like, does not do good or does not do labor that is is or is conducive towards good and he doesn't enjoy life or his labor as a result of that so i think what we should be seeing here is that there is already in chap up for chapters one through three a contrast between good and bad or right and wrong ways of living or virtuous and non-virtuous and that what God has given man, or maybe you could even say the purpose of life that God has imparted to man, is that he is to do work that is good, not a distraction, not vain, and to enjoy that work and to enjoy his life. 
on earth. It says this is God's gift to him. But then it says in uh, 3.18, I'm sorry, let's step back. It says in 3.16, I saw under the sun the place of judgment. The ungodly man was there. I also saw the place of the righteous man. The ungodly man was not there. I said in my heart, God will judge both the righteous and the ungodly. For there is a time for every action work. That's 3.16 to 17. There is a contrast between the righteous and unrighteous man. Between a life well lived and a life lived like crap. I said in my heart, this is 318, concerning the speech of the sons of men, God will judge them, so as to show them that indeed they are themselves like animals. This comes right after contrasting a good and bad life. And then right before contrasting good and bad life, it tells you what the purpose of life is. It doesn't say purpose or function or anything about teleology or telos or anything, but it does say what a good life as compared to a bad life is. A good life is one, and a good person is one who enjoys, who eats and drinks, verse 224, and enjoys the good in his labor. Then 312, there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and do good in their lives. Every man should eat and drink and experience the good in all his labor. So the good man enjoys his life, eats, drinks, lives life I don't want to say to the fullest because that's a cliche, but not in a selfish way, in a way that they do good in their works. The wicked man instead does vain work and is distracted by not focusing on things, in my terminology, of intrinsic value. I think that's how we should read this. Then ultimately, it says that in the end, at judgment, God will show man through judgment that he is just an animal. Again, God will judge them so as to show them that indeed they are themselves like animals. 318. Well, how are they like animals? Well, animals are created by God to live for a finite time and to do work that doesn't, that we don't view as having necessarily cosmic impact. Animals are made and designed to do what they do and they go about their work and they get the pleasure they can. And we you know, if I'm going to interject Aristotle into this, we call a horse a good horse because it does well what horses are designed to do. Maybe it gallops well. Maybe it's a particularly beautiful horse. Whatever. Man is no different from animals. Man doesn't have this cosmic purpose in that we need to go out on this great adventure to save the universe. Man is put on earth to enjoy his life on earth and to enjoy the good in his life. So have fun and enjoy things of that are good, of intrinsic value, and don't do bad things or don't get distracted. I think 318 shows that God and the judgment will humble man because man has thought as of himself as something fundamentally distinct from animals or other created creatures. They have one breath, they have one spirit, 319 for what happens to the sons of men also happens to animals one thing befalls them as is the death of the one so also is the death of the other and there is one breath to all they are not men and animals are not super distinct in that men are these godlike beings that transcend animals clearly they have a higher level of complexity clearly we have a different type of consciousness we do we are aware that we're going to die to a greater extent than animals are we suffer more we feel more pain than probably any other animal maybe other than higher primates but fundamentally we're not different we're creatures god has created and one of the sins that creeps in and one of the things that makes a life bad or makes you unvirtuous or makes you unrighteous is that you don't realize that you are an animal. You are not a divinity. You are not an angel. You are not above the created order. God has created you, given you this nice little home. I used to say when I was a kid, like God has given you like an environment kind of like a zoo where he can watch you or whatever and you are his intrinsically valuable artwork I think is the frame of mind that the author of Ecclesiastes is coming from and you're not going to live forever but there is really a contrast between a good life and a bad life it's not all vanity the unrighteous lives in vanity 
because they think themselves above the animals and they engage in distractions and meaningless work and tasks, not tasks that are good. And ultimately, I think, uh, and I'm not going to make this case because I want this to be a really short episode and I'm already at 15 minutes, the, the thing that makes your work in life have intrinsic value or be good is that it's directed towards God. That it situates itself towards God in the appropriate way. And I don't know exactly how to spell that out. Um, but that's the point. So at the end of the day, I disagree with their reading. Not all is vanity. That's hyperbole at the beginning. He says, vanity, vanity, all is vanity in one, two. But <laughs> that's to show that everything he's done is vanity. And there's another way to live. There's another way to have a good life. And that's focus on God. And I think that's, it's not just tacked on at the, at the very last verse of Ecclesiastes, like they suggest. Let's see. It's, um, eh, my Bible is too big. It's uh, Ecclesiastes 12, 13 to 14. Here's a conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole man for God will bring every work into judgment, including everything that has been overlooked, whether it be good or evil. That's not just tacked on at the end. Maybe, maybe it was actually tacked on, like a scribe or somebody else added it as a summary. But that is totally consistent with chapters 1 through 3. Right from the beginning, the first 3 out of 12 chapters, you have that same message. You have that same message. So, God has given man, individually and collectively, a purpose. To be a, a intrinsically valuable or good entity existing in this world and I'm putting that language into the text it doesn't say that there um, and your whole lot in life is just do good enjoy the good of your labor and life and have a proper perspective and orientation to God with your place in the world as a finite being vanity vanity all is vanity that's true if you are not properly oriented towards God or things of intrinsic value. And that, again, going back to the last episode, that lines up with Susan Wolf's conception of meaning so well. And I don't think I'm just reading that in. And I've given you um, the verses that I'm pulling that from, not as proof text, but if you read the whole thing in that frame of mind, it makes a lot more sense of the final verse, um, that summary of devote yourself to God. And um, I'll leave you with this. This is what I've been uh, pained by. And I just realized why I've been so depressed and anxious lately. I've just been in this crippling depression. Uh, Thus I've hated life because the work done under the sun was evil before me. For all is vanity and is the choice of one spirit. I think it's because I've been choosing the last few months. And I've, in some way in my MA program, I've been forced to choose to do a lot of work that I really feel and think is meaningless. I don't need to go deep into a lot of the things I'm going deep into uh, because they're ultimately distractions of the finite time I have to orient myself towards God, learn more about God, learn more about, you know, the really important things, the things that matter, not be uh, distracted by minutia that probably don't matter. There's a final proof of, I think, my position, and I don't want to say full proof because it doesn't prove it, but a final interpretive hint in 115. The writer, well, 114 at the end of that verse, he says, All is vanity and this is a choice of one spirit. 115, that which cannot, or that which has become crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. This is clearly an allusion to other, you know, passages of the Old Testament, um, particularly Isaiah, Isaiah 45 2. I'll go before you and I will level the mountains, I'll break down gates of bronze and cut through bo- uh, bars of iron. And then Isaiah 44, 44, not 44. Um, every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Uh, I really think that that's an illusion. It, the writer of Ecclesiastes is aware of either Isaiah or what the tradition in Isaiah that says that God can make the 
you know, the rough, the uneven, the crooked, straight. In the King James Bible, in Isaiah 44, it says, Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. I think this is an allusion to those, and he's using hyperbole to say, there's no hope. Nothing that's crooked can be made straight. That what's lacking cannot be counted. But clearly, that's supposed to remind you that God has promised his people, Israel, that if they follow him, if they align themselves properly with him, if they accept their rightful place, he will make that which has become crooked straight, that which is lacking, counted or filled. I don't know what you want to say there. So in the end, uh, the author of Ecclesiastes, I do not think is a nihilist or is not like Camus. Um, I think he is saying that a life without God um, is vanity and that work not not work that's not good is bad bad wow that's so stupid work that's not good is bad that's a tautology um work that is not properly oriented towards value or to god or does not orient you and place you in a position that god wants you in as an as a very complex sort of animal those are bad um striving to be more than what you are through gaining wisdom and knowledge is bad there is a real contrast and i think those are just the beginnings of a full interpretation of ecclesiastes but i definitely think that's not as nihilistic as they want to suggest all right listen to the podcast very bad wizards um hope that response helped anybody out there getting depressed over it or something. Bye.